1984, I was involved in uh, building an attraction called Tour of the Universe. Uh, it was a simulator-based uh, adventure ride with a difference, and its purpose was to uh, offer the public, um, well, a simulation of what the experience might be like if they too could go into space, an experience which has been shared by, um, I don't know if we've peaked 100 people yet, but relatively few of us. Um, at that time, uh, I was pleased to receive a visit from Canada's first astronaut, Marc Garneau. He took the ride and he told me, I hope he wasn't being just polite, that the blast off was pretty good. Um, one of my purposes uh, in, in putting together this uh, cluster of speakers is to uh, project the idea of Canada as a spacefaring nation. Uh, it's important, I think, in uh, a modern economy to uh, allow uh, your oncoming generations to identify with the world historical activities of the moment. And uh, if our young people uh, decide that uh, they can't make movies if they stay in Canada, they can't build cars if they stay in Canada, and they can't participate in the adventure of uh, the discovery of outer space if they stay in Canada, then we're going to lose a lot of very bright people. So uh, the idea here is to uh, evoke and, uh, and uh, give evidence of and eventually, I think, to glamorize uh, the idea of Canada as uh, a country very much engaged in, in this uh, wonderful adventure. Otherwise, uh, like other small countries, we stand on the sideline and we watch the superpowers, or what used to be the superpowers, invent the next century. Um, I think it was two years ago that we had the uh, inspiring and gorgeous Julie Payette here. Chris Hatfield was in the audience. And now it's time to hear from their new boss, Canada's first man in space and the president of the Canadian Space Agency, Mark Garneau. Thank you very much, Moses. Uh, in actual fact, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people have been into space now. So the numbers are increasing, but it's still a small number if you think that we have over 6 billion people on this planet. What I would like to do today is a departure from what I usually do. It's certainly going to be a growth experience for me, and it's to try to share with you what it really feels like to go into space. The second most asked question over my 18-year career of public speaking is, what's it like? Sometimes I think I've done a reasonable job of answering that question. More often than not, I come away feeling I didn't quite convey it. I'm going to try again today. <clears throat> when you're named to a crew with four or five other people a year before your flight, you begin to train with them, knowing that you are going to trust them with your life, and they are going to similarly trust you with their life. You form a very strong attachment to that crew so that by the end of that year, you have learned everything that you need to do to properly carry out the mission. About five hours before you lift off, you wake up, you have breakfast, you have a last, last medical examination, and then you head out to the pad. You arrive at the pad, you take the elevator up to 185 feet, you get off it knowing you're not coming down that elevator, probably not, and you embark aboard the orbiter. So you are sitting in your chair about three hours prior to liftoff. So I want you to imagine that by pretending that you are tipping your chair back 90 degrees and you're looking up at the ceiling. If you look up at the ceiling now and imagine it a little bit, in three hours, your chair is going to take off and you are going to hurtle through the roof. That's a little bit what it's like physically when you're sitting uh, in the orbiter waiting for that liftoff. It's not very comfortable. You're wearing a launch and entry suit, those big orange combinations. After a while, you really want to go to the bathroom. 
you have a diaper, so that's okay. But it's surprisingly difficult as an adult to pee in a diaper. <laughs> I remember in the three weeks uh, prior to my last flight, we had a practice, a dry run on board the shuttle. And, um, <laughs> and that morning, I drank coffee and juice and everything else. And then we did the countdown. We go, go down uh, all the way down to zero. And uh, anyway, about 10 minutes before, I said, why am I living with all this pain? So I went to the bathroom. And just at that point, somebody who was in the shuttle put their hand right on my stomach and said uh, something innocuous. And it was a very embarrassing moment, even though they had no idea that I had just <laughs> peed my pants. <laughs> so anyway, um, you are sitting there on board the shuttle, and you're waiting for takeoff. And it's surprisingly <laughs> quiet. There's very little going on. It's the computers that are checking everything. The fueling of that big brown uh, tank is continuing to occur. They're checking the fuel cells, which will give you power. They're checking hundreds, if not thousands, of different things, because it's got to be a very orderly sequence. And you have nothing to do, and it's kind of nerve-wracking. It's kind of nerve-wracking because you want to get on with it. If you're an actor, for example, it's the way you feel before you come on stage. If you're an athlete, it's the way you feel before you do your your, your athletic thing. So you go through a lot of things in your mind. You think about your family. Uh, you wonder if you told your, in my case, my wife, uh, how much you loved her. And if you've hugged your children and told them how much you love them. Because you know that there's a certain element of risk in what you're going to do. Uh, you wonder if you've sorted out your life. Have you done your will? Have you done your life insurance? Have you paid those bills? Is everything in order? And then you wonder about, are you ready for this mission? I remember thinking on my first flight, boy, this would be really embarrassing for Canada if I asked them to open the door now because I didn't really want to go into space. <laughs> You know, you know this is the point of no return. They have closed that shuttle hatch, and you are going up into space. It costs about $500 million to send the shuttle into space. Those are Canadian dollars. Um, and that's without doing anything. On my last flight, I helped install the P-6 truss on board the International Space Station, those big solar rays. That was a billion dollars worth of hardware. There are thousands of people who have supported you in getting you ready for this mission. Scientists, in the case of experiments that you're going to be their proxy investigator for or proxy performer of their experiments, who have toiled, in some cases, for 10 years to get their experiment ready so that you can do it. Uh, there's a lot riding on that shuttle mission. There are two fears that you have as you sit there and wait for the countdown. The first is, uh, is everything going to go right in terms of, of safety? And the second one, and the biggest one, is, boy, I really hope I don't screw up here. Because there are thousands of people and millions of dollars riding on how well I do this. Uh, it's certainly a very sobering thought. Fortunately, time goes by, and then you approach the point in the last 20 minutes where you start to hear things, and the activity starts to pick up, and you know that uh, the moment is finally arriving, and it's kind of a release, because you are now beginning to focus. You have been a prisoner, in a sense, of your thinking, because there was nothing else to do, but now you know that you've got to turn your mind towards your responsibilities. I was the flight engineer on my last flight, and my responsibility was to watch over the shoulders of the pilot and the commander to make sure that... Uh, uh, if anything went wrong, I would be backing them up. I was an extra set of eyes, I was an extra brain, and we would get into our procedures to see if we could get around the problem, and hopefully it wouldn't be bad enough to prevent us from getting to space and getting back, and hopefully it was an area where we had some built-in redundancy. So you begin to focus on that, because that eight and a half minutes that it takes to get into space is the most crucial and the most... Uh, rapidly occurring set of events. You don't have much time to think about it. And then in the last few seconds, six seconds to be precise, before liftoff, the three main engines light up. 
And if they all reach 90% thrust, then at that point you have a go for launch and those two big white solid, uh, solid rocket boosters are going to develop each over three million pounds of thrust. The three main engines that started lighting up six seconds before will each deliver about 500,000 pounds of thrust. So you have seven and a half million pounds of thrust lifting a four and a half million pound vehicle. So you've got a healthy margin excess of three million pounds of thrust. So you are going into space. And you've all seen uh, shuttle liftoffs. So you all know what it's like. The overwhelming sensation at liftoff is the vibration and the noise because those solid rocket boosters literally shake the very core of the orbiter or the what people typically call the shuttle. So you are shaking in your seat to the point where you're actually seeing double and you're trying to disconnect your head from the rest of your body so that you're not seeing all those displays numbers on the screen which you, you're riveted on uh, seeing them double. Uh, it's very hard to do that, but it's something you have to do so you clearly follow every sequence. The other part is the noise. Unfortunately, we have a helmet on so we can talk through that noise, but it is thunderous. In two minutes, those solid rocket boosters will burn out. During those two minutes, you have your fingers crossed. You can't turn off solid fuel. They're going to burn. You saw, it, you saw them burn on Challenger. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't disconnect them. If you disconnect them, you cannot regain stable flight. You have to let them burn. So that is really the time when you're in the hands of the gods. After two minutes, you're 45 kilometers up, traveling at 5,000 miles an hour. You have another six and a half minutes to go, but when those solid rocket boosters are released, you really do uh, heave a great sigh of relief. And it's a lot quieter. Those three main engines are not nearly as noisy. And for another six and a half minutes, you'll continue your upward ascent into space. And at eight and a half minutes, you have MECO, main engine cutoff. And at that point, you have been subjected to three Gs, three times the normal force of acceleration, or gravi gra gra three times the acceleration due to gravity. And that suddenly stops at eight and a half minutes, and you're projected forward. It's like slamming the brakes on the car. Fortunately, your safety belt is holding you there. And on my first flight, we arrived upside down. We went into space like that, and we arrived upside down. And you have no consciousness of this being upside down when you're in weightlessness because, I mean, the, the, everything in front of you has not suddenly flipped over. It's, it's still in its same frame of reference. And the quiet is just absolutely um, such a contrast with the the, the, the sheer power, the terror of everything that preceded it, and suddenly you are in space, floating in this beautiful, serene environment, and you can hardly wait to get out of your chair and float over to the window and look, look outside, and, and, and you feel that you've dodged a bullet, and this euphoria overcomes you because you've just been through a terrible event, and you're up there, and the magic begins. And you look out the window. And I remember the first time looking out the window. Maybe we can go to the next slide. That's not what it looks like when you're on the shuttle. <laughs> That's an historical picture taken after Apollo 8 returned from the moon. That was the first time we saw our whole planet. Uh, it was the first time we had a change in our perception of our planet. To me, that is the photo of the millennium. Next slide, please. That's more what it looks like when you're on board the shuttle. If you imagine the Earth being a basketball, you're only five millimeters above the surface of the basketball, but enough to see a great deal of curvature. And I remember floating over to the window, but we were upside down. I was looking out the window and expecting to see the curvature of the Earth like this below me, like you do when you're in an aircraft. But no, it was above me, and it was curving upwards. And I felt uncomfortable about it, so <laughs> I rotated myself 180 degrees. And then I said, ah, this looks right. <laughs> and I gazed upon it. And then I turned back in, and I realized I was upside down in the mid-deck. And so I turned myself back around. And then after a while, I just gave all that up. I gave up my reference frames. But to look at the Earth from up there 
after going through launch is a sublime experience. It really is. There are two parts of the experience that I'd like to try to describe. The first is, we can go to the, back to the other slide, Jack. The first part of it is the magic. It is a magical place, space, when you're in weightlessness. How many of you have dreamed of flying? Probably most of you. And here you are up there and you're flying. You are unshackled. You can do anything you want. And what it does is it unshackles your imagination. As you know, we all, as, as children, have an imagination. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old who have very well-developed imaginations. But me, as I grew up and learned adult rules and how to behave and what to do, kind of left my imagination behind. Well, going into space dramatically brings that back to you. You giggle a lot when you're up there. You look at other crew members, I'm talking test pilots here, and you giggle. You are up in this fantastic place and you're floating. And that magic stays with you during the whole flight. And I can remember one of the most perfect experiences I ever had was when I had some free time. We have some music that we bring up with, it, with us and I brought classical music. And I would put on my Walkman and just put myself in the middle of the cabin and float with my eyes closed, totally suspended, in the middle of the cabin, listening to Bach, Vivaldi, Handel, I like Baroque music, and the experience of listening to that music was intensified in an unimaginable way because I had absolutely no distraction. Nothing was touching me. I was just totally suspended and listening to the music in its purest form. Um, the magic. The other part is, and that occurs instantaneously, you feel that and experience that right away. The other part, which is probably more important, is that going into space alters your perception. When you're down on Earth, your horizon is about 15 kilometers around you. You may move around, move that, that circle around on Earth, but in a way, that's your world. And, and as one of the speakers mentioned last night, in a way, we try to shrink our world so that we can make sense of it. Going into space, unfortunately, does not allow you to do it. In fact, it goes in the opposite direction. It forces you to look at your world in an expanding manner as opposed to in a way that shrinks it down. And that's something that makes us feel a little bit uneasy. We're not totally comfortable in making that uh, that move towards looking at our planet from a broader perspective. But being up in space certainly does that for you. Physically, uh, it's definitely going to happen because you're 400 kilometers above the Earth and you look down at it and you see it and you see it against the blackness of space in a very dramatic way. And I believe you have to be there. You can't just look at pictures down here on Earth and be altered by space from looking at the pictures. You cannot experience it by proxy. You must be there. You know, when you go up in an aircraft at 35,000 feet and look at the Earth, you begin to realize there's a change that occurs. That 15-kilometer circle now is quite a bit bigger as you look out the airplane. You see some curvature in, 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 the, uh, in the Earth. Uh, you're not sure that uh, you're going that fast. It doesn't look like you're going that fast, but you are, in fact, uh, going quite fast because four hours later you're in Vancouver. So there's a change in the process from that point of view. Uh, when you're at 400 kilometers above the Earth and you go around the Earth in 90 minutes, 16 times every day, 16 sunsets, 16 sunrises, you realize the Earth is very, very small. And you look down at it, and it is beautiful but it's not only beautiful, you also see signs of the damage that you're doing to it. When I flew in 84, I saw a pall of smoke a million square kilometers above Amazonia in Brazil during the rainforest clear cutting. When I flew over Madagascar, I saw the Betsy Boko River uh, bleeding because the soil is red and there's been so much clear cutting, bleeding into the Indian Ocean. I've seen clear cutting over Canada. I have seen Lake Chad and know that it was quite a bit bigger at one time. I've seen the mess that the Sea of Aral 
is in Asia with the naked eye. And Mark de Villiers talked about water. He's right, water is going to be important in this century. And you see this from space. You see the desert advancing in the uh, sub-Sahara, in, in, in Africa. Not all of it is uh, man-made, by the way. Some of it is natural. Volcanoes are a good example. But that's where the transformation occurs in your perception. And that's what happens uh, when you go into space. And I'm seeing the red light as well. But you come back, and over the years, it's not an immediate process, but over the years, you begin to realize that you were changed by this experience and how, it, how important it is to take care of our planet, because it really is very, very small. I'm going to leave it at that, and thank you. Thank you.